Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks, Maxine. I'm Christina, and I'm an alcoholic. Can you guys hear me? Can I get a thumbs up from someone? Cool. Thank you. So nice to see your faces out there. I so rarely get a chance to talk for this long, and I am excited because the last few times I've gotten the chance to speak in AA, I've been asked to talk on my story, and it's really tough to get to just get all the juicy stuff in in um, 10 or 15 minutes, and so it's really nice to get to go into a little bit more detail, and I'm going to try to not bore you guys to pieces and um, and try to stick to the solution. So anytime I get the privilege to speak in AA, I like to start with a few things. Um, I have a sobriety date. It's the 16th of February, 2001. I have a sponsor. Her name is Marina M. And she knows where I am today. And I have a home group. Um, I've recently relocated back to Cape Town. And so my new home group here is the Green Door Meeting on a Sunday. Um, Everyone is welcome. And I would love to see some of you there if you can attend. So I like to, um, as a lot of you have heard me say before, I really like to start out with that stuff because I believe that it's easy enough to wander into AA and to take a seat here. But I think that over the years to stay here year after year through the ups and the downs um, takes some structure and some work. And for me, that has meant being connected to things like a home group and a sponsor and having a sobriety date. I have to tell you guys, like I had a drinking dream the other day. I haven't had a a drink or, or a drug in a long time. And, um, I had a dream the other day where I, where I was about to drink or I had drank. And in the dream, the most horrifying thing was that I had like lost my time, you know, and I had to like go and like be the newest person there. I didn't have time anymore. I didn't get to be an elder in AA. And I, that's a shitty reason to stay sober, but I will take it, right? If my ego plays any part in this, I'll take it. And I know a lot of people would say like, oh, we have to want this from our hearts, but there is value to accumulating time. I really believe that. Um, Because I'm the type of alcoholic that thinks, oh, I can just step out and drink today and then just come right back in tomorrow. Like I have this old idea that if I were to relapse, it would just be like for a week or two and then I'd be able to come back into AA. And I, I, over the years, I've, I've seen people go out on that idea that they'll be able to just come right back in and it takes them years or never right? To get back. It's like, that's such a lie that I'm going to be able to come back in and, and lean into this. And it's going to be here for me when I want, right? I think that for a lot of us, the opportunity to come to AA is like, it's like, there's this like crack in the door almost, right? It's like this, I had this like short, tiny little bit of willingness. And it was like someone had cracked the door to a new life open just a little bit. And I could like either take it and walk through it or turn around and go the other way and maybe never get that opportunity again. So I think, you know, the fact that I'm here and I'm sober today is not to be taken for granted. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit of my pitch on that. I'm going to start um I'm going to start at the early days of my drinking because we've got a little bit of time. So I'm American as a lot of you can hear and um I don't think my story is very abnormal. I think I'm quite a garden variety drunk. Um I started experimenting with with drinking when I was probably 13 or 14. I don't remember a lot of that. I don't remember a lot of those early days, but I do remember a lot of one or two really pivotal experiences of what my very first few drinks looked like. Um, and we had gone, my mom and I had gone to this like chain restaurant in America called TGI Fridays. And they were like known for like having these kind of cheesy cocktails with the umbrellas and all the fruit and the whole show. And I had... Um, I was, I was little, but I was, I remember looking through this drink menu and there were all of these incredible drinks. And as a little kid, they were colorful and they were exciting and they looked like fun and thrills. And I was like a bored 13 year old. And I, I thought that whatever was in that book looked very compelling. And I remember stealing it. I stole the drink menu and I smuggled it home and I started to kind of very casually request certain ingredients from my mom. Like, mom, could you pick up some orange juice? And as I kind of gathered these ingredients and I looked into the liquor cabinet, I invited some friends over and I was going to concoct some of these drinks that I had read about. 
And so the very first time that I remember doing this is um, a group of friends and I were going to a bowling alley. And so I mixed up some of these cocktails and we dumped out hairspray bottles and we washed them out and we filled them up with these concoctions of vodka and orange juice and schnapps. And we started to drink them right before my friend's mom was going to come and collect us to drive us to the bowling alley. Right. And so by the time I was in the back of the car of my friend's mother, I already remember being quite drunk and trying to like make pretend small talk. So I would appear sober to this woman and the bowling alley that we went to was quite far from my house. It was like 30, at least 30 minutes away. So we were driving there. And by the time we got there, I had already, I think I had already entered a blackout because my next memory is being in the bathroom of the bowling alley, just vomiting all over. My pants were around my ankles and I was sitting on the counter of this bathroom and I was just vomiting on myself. And I have no memory for of the next few hours until some, some woman in the bathroom approached me and said, um, do you need a ride home? And I'm sure I must have looked, I was young. I'm sure I must have looked like I very much needed a ride home. And I thought that this woman was friends with the people people that I came with, right? I was too drunk to tell that this was a complete stranger. And so I said, yes. And I got into a car with her and some other, into a van with her and some other people. And um, that story could end so badly. Hey, I got into a van with some strangers at a bowling alley, very, very drunk. And for a lot of people, it does end badly. For a lot of people, they never get past their first drink. They die, right? Um, incredibly, what happened is those people were decent people that tried to find my house. And I, this was before the days of GPS. So all I could tell them was my address. I said, like, I live at this address and they drove around for hours trying to find my house. And the only thing that I remember about them was that they said that they were from Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I think that that's insane. I think that AA has been saving my ass from the very first second that a drink touched my lips, right? You guys have, have been there from the very start. And um, I like to think that like the next day they were at their meeting saying like, but for the grace of God, there go I, right? Like, uh, you know, we saw this drunk girl and one day maybe she'll take a seat here among us. And, um, but that was my first drunk. And I remember getting quite in quite a bit of trouble with my mom. I remember coming home and I was very visibly drunk and I was really young and, and I got grounded and I got in trouble. And I remember thinking like, next time I will learn how to drink better. I will learn how to drink more manageably, right? I will learn how to not get as drunk. And amazingly, over all of my years of drinking or over my relatively short few years of drinking before I got sober, I never learned how to do it better. It never got better. It never got more um, tidy or in control. It was always just as out of control as that first drink, except I believed that it, I, till the day that I quit drinking, I still believed that it would get better, that I would learn how to control it. And that was like the per persistent lie for me that down the road at some point I was going to be able to control and manage my drinking. And I never, I never did. And so I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So that might, so from the beginning, I was drinking to get drunk. And what I discovered right at the start was that alcohol did something for me that was very, very magical and worth every single consequence that ever came. What alcohol did for me from the start was it gave me that sense of being able to like breathe, like feel comfortable in my skin, feel confident, feel free from the, the, the terror and the self-consciousness and the anxiety that I felt all the other times in my life when I wasn't drinking. It was really powerful. Um, and I don't know if I felt unconscious or, un or self-conscious or uncomfortable in my skin because I was a 13-year-old girl, you know, and that's how many people feel at that age, or because that is a characteristic of, of alcoholism. I really can't, I really can't say, but I remember from the very beginning having a drink and having that sense of just like I could breathe again. And all of the chaos and the mess and the shit that came afterwards I thought was a very small price to pay for the feeling of being able to be comfortable in my skin for a very short amount of time. So the consequences that I began to see very early on were pretty tremendous. Um, I started to have these kind of knockdown drag out fights with my mom and I left home at a really young age. So the first time I moved out of the house was around 13 or 14. I moved in with a friend and her parents were these like old hippies and they kind of, they were stoners and they didn't really care. And so began to kind of run wild at an early age. And a few, um, 
short years after that, I was getting kicked out of high school for acting as if the rules didn't apply to me and I could do whatever I wanted when I wanted. And really the truth at that time was that when I wasn't drinking or getting high or looking th for a thrill, I was, um, I was lost and uncomfortable and all of the messes that I made and the people that I hurt through that kind of selfish behavior, it's like the momentary relief of not having to sit with my discomfort um, always, always trumped whatever consequences or hurt feelings were going to come later. And I've discovered after a, a long time sober that I still have that kind of um, approach to life that my comfort is of the utmost importance and everything else is kind of peripheral. And it really um, hasn't been until like much later in sobriety that I've begun to learn that nothing good can come from me avoiding discomfort. That fundamentally at some point in life, I will have to be uncomfortable. And until I can kind of walk through that fire, I'm really never going to have the kind of peace or freedom that I want. And so, um, when I got when I got kicked out of school, um, I ended up going to like a night school program, which was for like pregnant moms or drug addicts. And it was like, just so you could get a degree, you would take classes at night, a couple nights a week. And so I started going to that program and there it was filled with like more drug addicts and people that were even further down the road to ruin than I was. Right. And so it just accelerated my path to chaos. And, um, I was really living as if, um, I mean, I was just living like a wild child. And my mom at the time had, she worked for the airlines and she had what were called back then at, at the airline that she worked for, they had these things called like write your own travel tickets. So if you were a family member of the airline employee, you would just take this paper ticket and put your name on it and show up at the airport and you would um, give them your ID and you could go to any place that the airline flew to, right? And so I still remember stealing like a pile of these tickets from my mom's desk and um, beginning to just kind of like decide I wanted to go somewhere. And I was working in a music club at the time. And these bands would like travel through the music club. And I was a young, cute girl. And so they would say very casually, like, oh, if you're ever in Southern California, like hit me up. And I would show up at their house like two weeks later and like ask to live with them. Right. And so I would like, you know, I bounced all over the country like this. And I had this thought at the time that whenever things weren't going good, I always just thought like this place is the problem. And if I can just get a change of scenery, everything will be better. And I would make up a story about the place that I wanted to go. So if somebody's mentioned casually Southern California, I would think something along the lines of like, yeah, I'm going to go to Southern California. It's like sunny all the time. Like get out of this cold weather and I'm going to learn to surf. And then I'm not going to drink and get high because you know how like surfers, they like get up in the morning really early. So I was like, I'll be getting up so early. I won't want to party the night before. And I would just cook up this story about how everything was going to get better when I was over there. Right. And so I would drop what I was doing and go over there. And of course I would like impose on other people. And of course I would drink anyway. And of course the mess would follow me because I was like the heart of the mess. And in no time it would be a shit show and I would want to leave. And I have the kind of mind, you know, a component of alcoholism is this, um, what our big book calls like a disease of perception, right? And that's, that's the kind of big words. And that's a little, that's a little fuzzy. So to just unpack that, it, it means to me that I have the kind of mind that is unreliable, right? I cook up stories that to me seem legitimate, but if you were a neutral observer looking in from the outside, you would say like, that's crazy, but I believe it, right? I could tell you, I could hold up a blue piece of paper and say like, this is red, right? That is the disease of perception. It's just like, I don't live in reality, you know? The difficult part is that reality pokes its head through occasionally, and I can see the horrible truth of my life. And that is extremely uncomfortable. And that's when I really need to drink and get high even more to crush that, to push that down. But anyway, we're still in early days. So I still believe the lie. I still think that over there is the answer. And anytime things get messy because of my selfish behavior, my insane, selfish behavior, 
Um, I can't see the truth. I don't see that I have created this mess. All I see is like, fuck, Tennessee is cool. You know, like, wow, rolling green hills. Like they've got a good music scene. Like, and then I just pop out somewhere else. So in this stretch of a few years, I lived all over the country and I would just meet somebody. Like, I remember this one time I was in Chicago. That's where I'm from. I was in Chicago and some friends said, we're going to drive down to New Orleans to go to Mardi Gras. Do you want to come? And I said, yeah. And they said, okay, we're leaving tonight. New Orleans is like a 15 hour drive or a 20 hour drive. So I didn't have anything with me, but a toothbrush and some like lip balm. And I said, fuck yeah, I'm going to get in the car. So I get in the car and the people that I was with were horrible. So I, as soon as we get to New Orleans, we're in this great party. I like ditched those people promptly to find better people. And I didn't see them again for like two years until I went back to Chicago. I met some random people and some random house and just made my way in there. And I stayed in New Orleans for like on that, that trip, three months, right? So this is a three day weekend. I was just to be able to drive back up with these friends. Three months I stayed there. And you know, one of the stories that I told myself about that time in my life was that I was like, you know, I had this like really, um, I had this real like romance with like the sixties and that hippie era. And I was, I told myself that I was like wild and free and like living this rock and roll life. And I could convince myself that it looked like that. Right. But the truth of it, when I got really honest or at four in the morning, when I was not quite as drunk and that little bit of reality would poke through, I could see that it wasn't, that wasn't the truth. There might be some freedom, but really I wasn't free. I was, um, I was, uh, the book has this great line about pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And when I was drunk, I didn't have any morals. I didn't have any self-restraint. I certainly didn't have any dignity, right? And I would behave in these very unpredictable ways and be mortified by how I acted. And the next day, I would wake up with this vague memory of something that I had done and be so disgusted and so uncomfortable from the disgust of how I had acted that the only answer was to like pour booze on top of it to just check out of how gross I felt, right? And it was like, then I would commit some other monstrous acts, trying to blot out the memory of the last monstrous act. And what I mean by like monstrous is I wasn't necessarily crashing cars or stabbing people. I would, um, I would get, I was a fighter. I'm very little. I'm five one. I don't know what that is in South African. I'm very small, but I would like start fights with grown men for no reason. I remember one fight, I got invited to like a posh pool party and I got very mad at the owner of the house because he had more privilege than I had. And I started screaming at him because of this nice house that he had. There's all of these posh people in their nice clothes. And I just looked like a lunatic, you know? And it's like, when I wake up and there's this disconnect between who I want to be and how I live, I don't know how to close that. I don't know how to behave better because when I'm not drinking, I am so uncomfortable in my own skin. I am so short of ideas on how to live successfully and be happy um, that really there's just no other answer. What I found anytime I tried to be sober for periods was that I just couldn't figure out how to live happily and comfortably. I remember this one time I was living in Southern California. I was sleeping on somebody's couch and these women, I forgot to start my timer. So I'm going to have to help me remember when I got to stop. I'm going to just shave off 10 minutes here. I was sleeping on somebody's couch and I had had a wild night drinking the night before. And it was like a Saturday morning and I was waking up and it was about eight or nine in the morning. And I was waking up because these girls were walking into the house and they said to the owner of the home, this guy whose couch I was sleeping on, we're going to play tennis. Do you want to come? And I remember just thinking like they were fucking aliens. Like I thought, who does that on a Saturday morning, wakes up at eight and goes plays tennis? Like it was so foreign to how I lived. And I thought like, is that even fun? Right? Like I had been, alcohol was part of everything that I did for so long. But the idea that people could do something pedestrian and nice, like play tennis without drinking or drugs and actually enjoy it seemed impossible. Right? And that's why getting sober seemed impossible. I couldn't imagine how people were having a good time, how they were even living. Because when I tried to put together any sober time, um, it didn't go well. I didn't behave better necessarily. And I didn't um, get 
the peaceful, happy life that I was looking for. So at this point in my drinking, I was getting, there was enough chaos that I would occasionally think that I should try to rein it in. And I remember around this time, I was living in San Diego in Southern California, and I had met a, a gentleman, a young gentleman that I really liked. And um, he was a good guy. And I wanted to be better. I, wa- I mean, I'm sure you guys can relate, right? There are things that happen to us when we're out there living this way. And we want to be better. We want to make an effort for the job or for the woman or for the man or for the whatever. And this was one of those cases. I wanted to, to, to do better. And so I put together 30 days dry right? I wasn't going to meetings, but but I wasn't drinking. And the level of um, madness, like insanity and, and discomfort was so indescribable. Like my brain was like a runaway freight train all the time. Um, Doing very simple things would be really overwhelming. Like going into a coffee shop to order a coffee I would just like stand in front of the register and feel like I don't know what to order. I don't know what to say. I'm going to drop the money. All the people are looking at me and they can tell that I'm uncomfortable. Once I order the coffee, where do I stand to wait for it? Like I was, I think nowadays, if I would have talked to a shrink, they would have said like, you're having a panic attack, but I didn't know that. All I knew was that that's what being sober felt like. And if I couldn't put together enough time to order a coffee without wanting to crawl out of my skin, how was I going to put together a lifetime of weddings and parties and New Year's living like that? I could not imagine a sober life that was happy and comfortable. And that was the heart of my problem, right? I didn't want what you guys had because I didn't think you had anything, right? I just just couldn't imagine it. And I think a lot of times when we're struggling to get sober... For me, it was a failure of imagination. It was a failure of vision. I could not envision that a sober life could be happy, joyous, and free. Even though you told me it could, and I could see that some of you were happy, joyous, and free, I couldn't imagine it for myself. And when I finally saw, I'm going to jump around a little bit. So like I mentioned, AA um, was part of my life really early on. I had that, that music club that I was working at. I had a boss there that was sober and he gave me a big book and he took me to a meeting and I don't know if he was working the steps I don't know what he was doing but I can tell you that he was part of my introduction to AA and if you are new to AA or if you are in AA but only peripherally and you're not really working the steps please do not think that you cannot save someone's life and you can't be of service because that guy was an integral part of the fact that I'm alive and in front of you right now. I don't really, I never saw him in a meeting after that. I have no idea if he ever picked up a big book or he worked the steps, but he told me about this thing and he urged me to go. And that was, um, that was a stone in the path. Right. And at the same time, I was also working a restaurant job and I called in sick one day and I, I called in sick and I told my boss, I cannot come to work because I got really drunk last night and I fell and I hurt myself thinking that he would be like sympathetic. And he said, um, he was also had, had some experience with AA and he told me either get a sponsor or get a new job. Obviously I like promptly got a new job, right? (laughs) And get a sponsor. Um, but that was another, like one of those introductions. And at the very same time, my mom began dating a man who was 10 years sober in AA. And he was telling my mother, he was telling my mom, um, your daughter's alcoholic. You don't need to, you should not enable her. Right. I loved him as you can imagine. And, um, so suddenly like there was this, there were these people in my life that were telling me that a, that AA might be a place that I needed. And so I began to go to meetings here and there. And I don't remember my first meeting, but I do remember, I do remember early experiences in AA. And like this one time I remember, um, you know, this was before, you know, I, I didn't have a cell phone and this was before like GPS. And I was trying to find this meeting in Southern California. And, um, I ended up like wandering into this kind of, underground mall thing and I couldn't find the meeting and so I stop in this storefront to ask this guy where it is and he's like I don't know where the meeting is but I'm a psychic and I do aromatherapy do you want to come in here and I was like yes this sounds much better than AA so I went with the aromatherapy guy and I told him my whole problem I was like my life's a fucking shit show I can't stop drinking and I don't really want to stop drinking but everything's a mess and I don't know what else to do and 
he put this aromatherapy oil in this little piece of red velvet for me. And he was like, here, take this. And I remember thinking like, yes, that's the ticket. You know, that's all I need. When I feel anxiety, I'm just going to sniff the thing and I'm going to be good to go. Right. Like I just, any solution, but this, right. I it's now looking back, it's incredible to me. AA has millions of people sober. And I thought this was very flimsy, but I was sure willing to like put my money down on the aromatherapy table and like no judgment. If you do aromatherapy and that's part of your wellness regime, like hats off to you, but that was not enough for me to change my life, you know? And so eventually I started to like attend some meetings here and there. And it was like, I was in such a fog that it didn't really most of it didn't really land. It, it didn't really like sink in for me. Um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. I'm skipping around a couple, a lot of shit happened, right? I like lived all over and I had a boyfriend who died. And once this boyfriend died, I started to drink like I really meant it, you know, and I was just off the rails. Finally, I wound up back in Chicago where I'm from. And, um, I wound up back in Chicago and this stepdad of mine was telling my mom, like, do not enable this girl. I asked my mom, can I live with you? I have nowhere to live. My boyfriend has just died. Like I'm, I'm, I, at that point was bouncing around and kind of like sleeping on couches. And she said, yes, you can live here as long as you don't drink. And so I said, okay, I'm not going to drink. Let me live at your house. And obviously I, I couldn't not drink. So I stole, they had some cooking vermouth that I stole and um, I was like too lazy and unmanageable to like hide or throw away the bottles. So I just left them, you know, I left them in the closet and they found them, of course. And then they came out and they said, you said you wouldn't drink if you lived here. You are drinking. You have to go. And I remember walking out of my mom's house that day. And my memory of it is that I walked out into a snowstorm. Right. And I just had nowhere to go. And it's like snowing and hectic and like. It may or may not have actually been snowing, you know, like now looking back, I have no idea. I'm like, really love the drama. And so I remember like being tossed out into the cold. And what I ended up doing is there was like, you know, these like youth hostels, like backpackers, right? There was a backpackers in, in the city. And um, my dad, I called up my dad and my dad's a really unusual man and um, kind of a weirdo, but he knows how to hustle. And he said like, you can't live with me, but I will pay $20 a night for you to stay at this backpackers in the city. And so I go to stay at this backpackers and you're only allowed to stay there two weeks. I pretend that I'm like traveling, right? Not that I'm just like some homeless drunk child, which was the truth. Pretend that I'm traveling. And obviously it's like full of Australians and they're going out drinking every night. And so I'm like making friends and having a party. And um, I turned that two weeks that you're allowed to stay in that stay there for about two months. And eventually the people that own the backpackers caught on that I was not traveling through. I was riffraff. <laughs> and they said, you got to go. And this guy that I had met there was also homeless. And he, um, he was a black guy with a fake British accent. And he had anarchy tattooed across his neck. So definitely my kind of person. And we started like being homeless together. And one of the girls that was staying in the backpackers was staying there because her building, she was a Chicago resident and her building had caught on fire. And so it was no longer fit to live in. And so they had paid for her to stay at this place. And she said to us, as we're looking, you know, we're leaving. She said like, here's the keys to my place. It's not structurally sound, but if you need a place to sleep, you can go there. So we went and we started squatting in this girl's like half burnt on apartment in Chicago in the winter. And um, it wasn't cool to stay there during the day. So during the day, we would just wander around and hang out at the library. We did what homeless people do. We hung out in free public heated spaces. And um, soon enough, we got caught. And so I started sleeping on the subway or um, I slept in the airport a lot because I remember from when, when I was traveling on my mom's passes, that if you're sleeping in the airport, they usually think that you have a layover, that your flight got canceled. And sometimes they'll even give you blankets or hotel vouchers. So I would sleep in the airport pretending that I was stuck. And then I would get on the subway. You know, the airport starts getting busy really early in the morning. So at four in the morning, we would leave the airport and ride the subway. And I remember just being cold for months. I don't know how long that stretch actually lasted, but it lasted a minute. And I just remember not ever, ever getting the chill out of my bones. And um, what happened was I ended up getting this little waitressing job, this shitty little waitressing job. I was too young to serve alcohol, so I could only work at breakfast and lunch places. And I, I took this little waitressing job, and it was attached to a gym. 
And if you worked at the restaurant, they would let you store your stuff in the gym locker. So I would shower in the gym and store my backpack full of dirty clothes in this gym locker. And then, you know, at like when I left my job, I would pretend that I had a normal life. And um, I remember this one time we were, I had left that little job for the day and I had my day's earnings, right? And I, this is how my alcoholism looked. I could never save my money to like get a little place to live. I would just burn it in that minute. And I remember walking into this like cigarette joint and um, they had these like, it was like in the hipster part of Chicago and it was like, you know, the early 2000s. And I remember they had all these beautiful like feather boas and like Mardi Gras costumes and I was like I need a feather boa and so I like was going to like spend my one day's earnings on this extravagant feather boa and then I wanted to get a cigarette holder and the lady at the counter says like well if you have a fancy cigarette holder you can't just light it with a bic you need like a posh lighter and I was like yes yes and so I'm about to spend my whole day's wages at this on this shit on garbage and this guy that I'm homeless with comes in and says like what he wasn't working, right? So it was important for him that I did not waste our money. I wasn't sleeping with him or anything. This is just like the code, right? So he said, like, what? What are you doing? Like, we have nowhere to sleep tonight. You think there's a fucking car waiting to come and whisk you away like you're a film star? Like, this is insanity. And for that moment, I saw how crazy it was, right? And this is this epitomizes how I live. I want what I want, when I want it, in the moment without any ability to see the bigger picture it doesn't matter the big picture is not available to me my pleasure and relief in this moment that's the only show in town and that's why i burned my life to the ground again and again and again and again that is the unmanageability of my alcoholism so I start going to meetings at this point and this guy that I'm homeless with, his dad had gotten sober from a heroin addiction in NA, right? And he had the presence of mind to look at the meeting directory, the AA meeting directory and look at the subway schedule and physically help me get to meetings. I do, I do not believe that I would be sober today if I did not have someone to say, this is what time the meeting is at and I'm going to take you there. I did not have the presence of mind to look at the schedule and look at the and look at the subway map and get myself anywhere. And so I really do believe that we have these little people that are placed in our lives that just give us the tiniest nudge. And, and, and that was one of them. He didn't need to be sober, but he went to meetings anyway with me. And I began to have the most insane experience, guys. I was partially there because I wanted to be in a warm place and because you could bump cigarettes and get free coffee. And sometimes they were like candy and sweets. And I would look it was really early AA was interesting to me. I used to go to this place in Chicago. It's very famous. It's called the mustard seed and it's been there since the thirties or something. And they have meetings around the clock. Um, basically they have meetings starting at four in the morning and ending at about one in the morning. So there's only a few hours when you can't get to a meeting. There's always people in there. And so I would go there and some people were sober and some people were not. Um, but what would happen is I would stay through the meeting until the end of the meeting when they did the prayer, right? And I didn't even really believe in God. I believed in some kind of spirit of the universe, but I certainly was not the praying kind. But when I would like hold hands with the people and do the prayer, I would feel this tiny little flush of warmth come over me. And so I would stay to the meet till the end of the meeting just to feel that little flush of warmth. It was worth so much because I was so empty and so dead and so numb. And I would like, you know, I would look at the steps on the wall and I would think like, those are very nice. That's nice, but it's not big enough to get me out of the mess that I'm in. That stuff like searching in fearless moral inventory and, you know, admitting my faults to God, that's not going to get me a place to live. I really thought that once I got my life in order, then I could maybe do this AA thing. I really had it in reverse. And the truth for me was that until I did this AA thing, I could never get my life in order because I really tried to do it the other way. I tried to fix the outside in order to get comfortable on the inside, but it just never, ever, ever worked. At the end of my drinking, I missed this part of the story, but it's important. Um, at the very end of my drinking, 
I thought that the answer was to just detox and start fresh. And so um, I went up to Northern California. I had some friends that grew weed for a living and they were going to go take their weed to Amsterdam and they needed somebody to watch the dogs. And they had, they lived out on the land, like out in the mountains, hours. There was, we were two hours from the closest petrol station and I did not have a car. And they left me there for six weeks in this little yurt. Y'all know what a yurt is. It's like a Japanese log cabin, right? It's basically covered in fabric. And I was there to trim weed and watch the dogs. And I thought this is going to be perfect. I'm going to read books. I'm going to journal. I'm going to reflect on my life. I'm going to detox and I'm going to figure out where I went wrong and I'm going to get back on track, right? That did not happen, right? I did read, I did detox, um, but I didn't figure it out. You know, I kept like trying to look back at my parents thinking I could pinpoint something that went wrong in my childhood. And once I could pinpoint it, then I would like it right. All that happened was that I was alone for six weeks and really needed a drink. And by the time I got out of there, I drank just as if I, I picked up exactly where I had left off. And what I discovered was that sobriety was not enough, right? And I'm going to, I'm going to continue on that theme now, skipping forward. So I'm going to the mustard seed. I'm going to meetings, but I am not working the steps. I don't think that the steps are big enough to fix my life. And I also think like, isn't it enough that I'm just here, right? Like I was young. I hadn't even had a legal drink. Like I hadn't in my mind, I hadn't lost everything, right? I obviously, I didn't have a lot to lose, but I wasn't doing great. But I thought like, I'm not as far advanced as these people. I don't need to do everything that they've done. So I wasn't doing the steps. I wasn't doing anything. And I got so insane and so suicidal in AA, right? So I was going to more than one meeting a day. I hadn't, I wasn't drinking, but I wanted to die. And I really could not figure out what the hell was wrong because now I'm not drinking and I still feel more insane and uncomfortable than ever. So what is the problem? And I thought, um, you know, if drinking was the problem, then when I stopped drinking, I should feel better. My life should get better, but it wasn't. Now that's a, that's a hell of a place to be. I was really out of ideas and I ended up um, sitting in this, I got a little place to live and I was sitting in this bathtub at this place to live and I was uh, about to commit suicide. I'm in this bathtub. I'm three months dry, right? And I prayed to this God that I did not believe in. And I said, either help me heal me or just kill me, right? Because I cannot live and I don't know what the problem is. That's hell. Not how do you fix something that you can't even identify, right? Where do you even start? And I can tell you right now, I am 19 years, 19 and a half years sober. The single greatest fact of my existence right now, as I sit before you, is that I know exactly what the problem is and I know exactly what the solution is. And that was what was missing for all those years. And so I made this prayer and that was the crack in the door. Something happened. I became slightly willing to accept help. So the next meeting I went to, I raised my hand and I said, can anybody be, I first I had told somebody, I can't find a sponsor because I don't see anybody that has what I want. How's that? Hey. And um, I mean, I really wanted a very particular kind of person. I thought if we're going to walk this road together, she's got to be really just so. And I wasn't seeing that. I was seeing a bunch of drunks. And so somebody said, okay, if you can't find somebody, just get a temporary sponsor. And I was like, cool. Like that's, I'm like a temporary kind of girl. Like that works for me. So I raised my hand and I said, can I get a temporary sponsor? And um, this was a huge breakthrough for me to be able to raise my hand at a meeting and ask for help. And so at the end of the meeting, I expect this deluge of people rushing over to me. Because you guys in AA, you always talk about like, service. We got to help people. So I really expected to be run over by people so enthusiastic to help me. Nobody came over guys. Nobody came over. And I thought that is it. I am finished with this shit. They are full of shit. And I walked outside and I remember being pouring rain, right? And it may or may not have been raining. It might not have been raining at all, but in my memory, it was like pouring rain and I've got nowhere to go. And at this point I was still homeless. And um, I'm skipping around time-wise, but um, I haven't gotten to tell my whole story in so long. It's like getting the chronology chronology right is tough. So finally, as I'm walking up the road, this woman rushes up to me and she says, I'm sorry, we were talking, but I can temporarily sponsor you. And she says, I don't have a lot of time, but my sponsor told me that I'm available. And I say, okay, all right. So I look her up and down and like, I tell you guys, 
she did not have what I want. Um, she was, she looked like her story. Hey, she looked like she had stopped doing Coke about three days before. Um, and she had a breathalyzer in her car because she had gotten so many DUIs that the car wouldn't start unless she blew. And so she'd be like taking me places and the thing would sweep me on the highway going 90 miles an hour and the thing would say beep and she'd have to stop her like AA pitch and like blow. And um, in her house smelled like cat piss. Like she was not the picture of like happy contented recovery at all. But she saved my life, like for sure. And um, what happened was that she told me to call her every day. So I start calling her every day. And it's the first time in my life, like it was like some that there was this crack in me. I just became willing to be honest with one person for the first time ever, like really honest, not like a spin or not like emotional. I could be like emotional on cue to, to manipulate you or to get a response or to make you do what I want. But I was never really real with anybody about what was really going on, mainly because I was like lying to myself all the time. I couldn't even see it. But for her, for some reason, I think because she was not someone to impress, right? Like there was not, she, in my head, I could get nothing from her and I did not need to impress her. So I just started telling her the truth and I would call her and what I would find, I would dump. And I, what I would find is that I would get this like two seconds of relief from her that I used to get from drinking, but had stopped getting, right? Remember how at the beginning of my story, I described like when I drank, I would get this like, oh, I can breathe, I can talk to you, I can be comfortable in my skin. Like I'm just like loose and I'm good and I'm feeling it. That has stopped long ago, right? I hadn't gotten relief from drinking or drugs in a long time. Um, but I, but I couldn't live when I was sober. It was so uncomfortable that I kept believing that I could get some relief from drinking. So I would try it thinking that it would be like my first or second time when I did get the relief, you know? So I'm talking to this lady, her name was Vanessa and I'm starting to get some relief and she's taken me through the big book and she would meet me in like burger joints and stuff because, um, I later found out that she thought that she wouldn't have me to her house because she thought I would steal from her and I fucking would have, <laughs> And so she's meeting me in burger joints and reading the big book to me and like talking way too loudly about God. And I'm like mortified. Like she's talking about God in public. And I was just on the whole thing. So distasteful and so horrifying, but I start to get better. And right away, my life started to change. Like the most, ins she told me to pray every morning and every night. Now, mind you, I was really uncomfortable with the God stuff. I, when you said God, anything that you said after that, I pretty much couldn't hear because in my head, as soon as you said God, you showed that you were a ding dong and that anything else that you said was not going to be relevant. But for whatever reason, I was desperate. And so I was just so desperate to feel differently that I just started doing everything that she said. I didn't pick and choose. I just did it all. And, um, so she started telling me to pray in the morning and at night and ask something to help me stay sober. And so I was doing it. And I, it was as if I had the compulsion to drink just lifted out of my body. I, it is, I don't know how to describe it to you guys. It was like, it was like someone had flipped a switch in me in that compulsion to have to drink, no matter how many times I swore off, it was just taken away. Um, and what I discovered, what she, what she taught me through taking me through the big book one page at a time. And she taught me some really crucial stuff about alcoholism that I did not know. She taught me about the allergy, the physical allergy that alcoholics have, which means that if for me as an alcoholic, the second I take any amount of alcohol, any amount at all, I crave another drink, right? And it doesn't matter where I said I was going to be. It doesn't matter if I said I was not going to drink. Um, it, nothing matters. All I can see is that second drink and I'm going to keep drinking until I run out or I pass out. I do not have an off switch, right? So she taught me about that. And that explained that why, when I started, I could never drink like a lady. Like when I started drinking, all bets were off. And then she taught me about the obsession of the mind, which is this thing that, that alcoholics share this, I, this, it, it has to do with the disease of perception that, I would always believe that this time it will be different. I would believe that, okay, if I just take some pills before I drink, I will be calm. I won't get into any fights. Everything will be fine. Or if I just drink at home, it will be okay. Or this time it'll be different. This time it'll be, um, 
just fun and lighthearted. And I believe the lie over and over again. The best way that I've heard the mental obsession described is this one guy once said, anybody that has three bottles of wine will probably get drunk and act like a fool and dance on a table. Anybody will probably do that. But for the alcoholic, we believe that this time we won't do that. Isn't that a great explanation? It's like believing that we won't do that. If you tell a cancer patient they, they have cancer, they're not like, no, I don't. I'm just having a bad day. They, they're like, oh my gosh, God, cancer, that's really heavy. Like, what can I do about it? They wouldn't just think that it's a lie or be like, okay, I have cancer. I'm going to get better. I'm going to start eating right. I'm going to go for chemo. And then the next day, just forget they had cancer and start smoking again. They, they wouldn't do that. But that's how insane my alcoholic mind is. And why that's really difficult is because normal drinkers don't think that way about alcohol. They don't think like that. And I think, because I'm so crazy, I think I'm a normal drinker. I can't even see that I have this problem. How can you fix a problem that you don't even think you have? And then the last thing that Vanessa taught me about, this triangle of alcoholism, this triangle of despair, is what they call the physical, or excuse me, the spiritual malady, right? And I talked a lot about that in different ways. And the spiritual malady is like when I was describing to you how I felt like my discomfort in the world without a drink or a drug, my um, wanting to claw my way out of my skin, my inability to settle down into life as it is, that is the spiritual malady, right? And what I discovered through working the steps with this woman was that, you know, I always thought that, um, you know what, sometimes they say like, if you just don't take that first drink, you're not going to get drunk. You're not going to cause mayhem and embarrass yourself, Right. Right. So if you just treat the physical allergy, right, you're not going to create a mess. And basically your alcoholism is sorted. Right. But the problem is, is if you have the mental obsession, your brain will always tell you that this time it's going to be different. It's not an issue. Drinking isn't even it just seems like as normal as normal as ever. Right. Just a glass of wine with dinner. Innocent. Right. So I can't treat the physical allergy unless I treat this part of my mind that tells me that alcoholism is not a big deal. But here's the kicker. I can't treat either of these two things unless I treat the spiritual malady. Because if I want to claw my way out of my own skin and the only relief that I ever have gotten is from drinking, I guarantee you I'm going to take that drink again and again and again, right? So that is why our solution is spiritual. It's like until I can find a way to live in my own skin without needing relief, without needing to take the edge off, I will always drink again or fill in the blank, whatever you do. I have a bevy of ways I like to get relief. When I stopped drinking, I discovered a lot of them, right? If I can't take the edge off with a drink, uh, I have used food, spending, relationships, jobs, busyness. Busyness is a hell of one because that one looks like you're doing good, right? But really all it is is like, I don't want to live in reality. I'm uncomfortable. I want to distract myself, anything to just not be here right now as it is. That is the core of my problem. 19 years later, that is still the core of my problem. I just don't know how to live in reality right now, right here, as it is, you know? And that's why the steps work in this magical way is because they reorient our insides so that we are suddenly not just comfortable, but we can be happy, joyous, and free, right? That's like the extreme opposite of needing relief. It's contentedness. No, I didn't get from where I was to happy, joyous, and free overnight. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. That first sponsor of mine, Vanessa, she didn't stay sober. She um, she relapsed, and she had given me her sponsor's phone number when we first started working together and said, if you ever can't get a hold of me, this is my sponsor's phone number. You can call her. And her name was Kita, and she sponsored me for years. And she was um, as different from me as you could get. She was a former Marine. She was very Christian, very Republican. I was like the opposite of all those things, but my God, she had structure. And for some, I think it was truly the grace of God. I was able to hear her. And if you have a sponsor and you are struggling, I just urge you to find someone whose voice gets in there because 99 people had told me the same exact thing and I couldn't hear it. And for some reason, when she said it, it could get in and I could surrender enough to do it. I just had no fight left in me. And so I did the steps as if my life depended on it. I did all of it. I got a home group. And then the theme of this meeting is like AA through the ages. And I really, I'm I fucking, excuse me, sorry, I'm not supposed to swear, but I got, I don't have that much time. And so I really wanted to talk about my experience over time in AA. 
So that lady, Kita, she told me to come to this home group and it was really far away and I didn't have a car. It took me like three hours to get there on public transportation. It was the biggest mission ever. But in that meeting was like the AA that I believe is like the lifeblood of why we are still here all these years later. There were a whole bunch of people that had worked the steps out of the big book and they had recovered. And that meeting was full of laughter and joy and freedom. And I would go there a week after week and week after week, I would leave different than how I came in. It was like they worked their magic on me. And um, that was my home group for eight years until I moved to South Africa or until I moved somewhere. I don't remember where I moved, but I moved. And um, to this day, those women from that group 19 years ago are still the backbone of my recovery. I'm still in contact with most of them. Um, And what I want to describe to you is something that Bill talks about in his story. He talks about walking into meetings and saying like the feeling was electric, you know, and there was this sense of people that had a real answer. Like they talk about laughter and people that had transcended their problems. And that is what to me, AA should feel like that. If that is not what it feels like in our meetings, I think we need to turn up the heat, right? This place of like, like lightheartedness. I remember So I've moved around a bit in recovery and five years ago, I left Cape Town and I moved to Seattle for a job and I got a home group there. And um, I'd been part of this home group for a year or two when I had lost this job. This was like the biggest job of my career. It was a big deal. And I had moved, you know, across the world to take this job. I was a single mom, everything rided on this job, right? Everything rode on this job. It was a big deal. And I lost this job really suddenly. And I remember walking into my home group that night, kind of devastated. And there was this row of old timers. And I walked up and I just said, guys, I lost my job. And they broke out in cheers and applause. Like it was the best thing they had ever heard. And I remember thinking, like, what? But I get it. They had been in AA a long time. They know that things work out. And then when one door closes, another opens. And there's just this sense of like, lightheartedness and joy. And no matter what happens, we are going to thrive. That is the message that I get. And I would walk into those rooms and see, you know, there are old timers that I've known over the years that um, when I walk into a room, I, they don't even need to talk. I can just see them in the room and feel safer, feel like I can breathe, feel like no matter what I walked in with, it's just not that big of a deal. Like, like we're going to be fine. Right. And that is like, something in just their being sent out that message, right? That it's all going to be great, you know? And that was why I couldn't get sober for so long. I just couldn't see how it was going to be great. I couldn't see how it was going to be okay, let alone great. And, you know, when I was very first getting sober, I remember thinking, you know, I was really, really young and I didn't know anybody that didn't drink. And the people that I did know that didn't drink or party were like party. They were like lame and boring. And I thought their lives were pathetic. But by the end of my drinking, it had just gotten so ugly and so painful that I was willing to settle for a pathetic life, you know, a quiet little life. And that's really what I thought for myself. And that sounded good. That sounded better than the chaos and the pain and the getting kicked downstairs and just the ugliness of my drinking and the pain. And And I remember thinking like the best that I could do was get a little apartment with a little job. And I remember learning how to play guitar because I thought like, I'm not going to have any friends. So I'm going to need to keep myself busy, you know? And I I had just envisioned this tiny little life, you know, and I thought that would be enough. And if you're here and if you're new, I just want to tell you this thing. If you really do this thing, the way that the founders intended you to do it, It will just blow the roof off of anything that you think is possible for yourself. Because the life that I have right now and the life that I've lived as a result of my contact with you guys, it's just so beyond anything I could have ever, not even hoped, but I would have even dreamed possible, right? I've lived all over the world. I've traveled to some 30 countries. I've had this incredible career. I have a beautiful child and a beautiful partner in some of the deepest, most enduring friendships that I can even I can't, I can't even describe them more than any of that. I have a peace and contentedness that I did not believe was possible for someone like me. I have an ease in this world. Um, For the old timers out there, the people, I think that you can't actually call yourself an old timer until you got 30 years. So I'm, I am, I am not there, but for the people with time who are in pain with time, I just, I think I've only got five minutes left, but it seems really important for me to touch on this. When I was 16 years sober and living in Seattle, I hit a bot. I have hit many bottoms in sobriety, right? 
some, you know, there's some really great circuit speakers that talk about them coming at intervals. I hit one about four years sober. I hit one about eight years sober. And I hit a really nasty one around 16 years sober. And in my time with you guys in Alcoholics Anonymous, I have always had a sponsor. I have always had a home group. I have always sponsored people. I've always stayed in this work, right? So these these were not, I don't believe that these were bottoms from being dry. I think that this is part of our natural growth cycle. But, you know, it's like a tree losing its leaves. You know, if you're a tree losing your leaves for the first time, you just think you're dying. Like, this is the end of it. It doesn't really feel like a, the potential of a new beginning. You know, in spring around the corner, it just feels like crisis. And that's what it felt like to me. I was living in Seattle, and I was, um, I, I, I felt like I was living in a pressure cooker. Something was so wrong and I was so uncomfortable and I would drive my car to work in the morning and kind of hope that I would get in a nasty car accident so I could just spend a few weeks in a hotel room, uh, in a, that would be nice, really nice, in a hospital room. Like I was so crazy and desperate that I just wanted to be in a hospital bed somewhere checked out. And I didn't understand what the problem was. And I would call my sponsor and say, you know, I'm, doing the steps. I'm doing my meditation. I'm sponsoring girls. I'm doing all this extra stuff. Like, what is the problem? And I remember her saying to me, um, I mean, that's cool, but like busyness is not surrender, you know? And what I discovered was that in a lot of ways at that point in my recovery, I was living AA as if it was a checklist and I was living as if AA was kind of Santa Claus, right? If I do this, this, and this check, 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 I'm going to be happy, joyous, and free. You know, I do the nightly inventory, I get happy. And so when I wasn't happy, I thought like, what is going on? I'm doing my part. And what I discovered was that the map is not the territory, right? The steps are just all they are. They're a roadmap to a power greater than yourself so you can find some freedom. They are not God itself, right? And when I act as if the steps are God, what I inevitably find is that I'm just I'm just throwing my human power at my problems. I am going to be restless, irritable, and discontent. What I needed to do was actually connect with a living higher power, you know? And I did that, yes, through the steps, but more than that, I did that through creating space and getting quiet and opening myself up to actually experiencing this power rather than just um, ticking stuff off the list. So I was 17... I was 17 years sober before I really had this experience of like, my God is love. And it was, it blew the roof off. And I had a really different experience in AA. And, um, and I think that's important. I think it's really important to talk about the really rough and the ugly spots because it hasn't been all rainbows and sunshine since I've been here. It has been, there have been times when it is desperately, brutally, painfully hard. And so if you're here and you're having that experience, I just, I urge you to stay and continue to engage in this work because it has continued to remain the solution for me, right? Remember at the beginning, I said, I didn't know what my problem is. I really, really fundamentally to this day, I believe that we have one problem and one solution. The one problem is always, it's just lack of connection, right? Between you, between me and myself and between me and my higher power. And the solution is always, it's just that connection. And I get that here. Um, I get that through you. And I'm so, I am so filled with gratitude that you guys were patient with me, that you continue to show me this path. But more than that, that you lived this. So I could see that I could see your living demonstration of what it looked like to do this work and to be okay, to be okay no matter what happened. Um, I owe my life to Alcoholics Anonymous. I hope that I continue to believe that the answer that you offer is the one that I need. Thank you very, very much for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.